Assalamu alaikum, hello and welcome to The Health Show here only on the Islam Channel with me, Alistair Greener. In this third series, we continue to tackle everyday health problems, where every week we'll be joined by a health expert within their specialised field. And we'll discuss the prevention of health issues or concerns that we or our loved ones may face. Looking at how you can change your health and lifestyle for the better, The Health Show offers an alternative viewpoint from our health experts who attend the show, which we hope will help guide you in the right direction. So if you suffer from any medical issues or you have any health concerns, or for that matter, if you know anybody who does, then tune in each week as we'll be covering a wide range of topics and offering alternative viewpoints from our health experts. And if you'd like any further information on our programmes or any of the topics that we discuss, please do get in touch. Health show at islamchannel.tv. Right, on with today's show. And today we're discussing lung disease. Lung disease is one of the most common medical conditions in the world. Millions of people suffer from lung disease worldwide, and it can be caused by smoking, infections, and even genetics. I'd like to welcome our guest today, Dr. Saeed Abdallah, a consultant chest physician at the Royal Brompton Hospital in London. He's fortunately happily agreed to discuss the symptoms and related issues to respiratory, chest and lung illnesses with us. So welcome back to the show. Lovely to see you again. Thank you. Thank you for having me. It's, it's, it's great. We've got lots to talk about. Thank you. Now, the lungs are part of a complex apparatus expanding and relaxing thousands of times each day to bring in oxygen and expel carbon dioxide. Lung disease can result from problems in any part of this system. So what about pollution? Can that play a part? Well, we're going to take a look at a clip of growing Pakistan, home to some 200 million people, where they suffer from some of the worst air pollution in the world. This is thanks to a giant population driving poorly maintained vehicles on the roads, as well as unchecked industrial emissions. started uh, reading up on air quality and that sort of a thing and I came to know through a friend of mine that uh, Pakistan does not officially monitor air quality as uh, an official initiative which is quite shocking because um, uh, for a country of this size uh, and population this kind of an initiative is a must. Car, bikes, all, all these are suffering from that and also they are working in uh, these kind of uh, workshops. They are causing allergies. They are all there. All over. And we don't. We don't have a specific, but there are specific workers doing. They are doing whatever they are doing. But when they are in the front of environment, environment is bad. Ultimately, it will cause these diseases. That was a fascinating report, and although obviously they have such a huge population and maybe vehicles that emit even more pollution than maybe other cities, but most cities seem to be affected by this incredible pollution. How does that affect the lungs? Lungs are sensitive organs. They are lined by a sensitive membrane, the mucous membrane, and it, it is affected by air quality. When the air quality is bad, there is inflammation of the lining of the airways. And that, in turn, will cause the muscle that wraps the tubes to contract. And that would lead to problems with breathing, asthma being the most common one. Well, let's talk about asthma, because I've, does, it, does it really make the asthma that much worse? Oh, absolutely. London, actually, people do not realize that, is the most polluted city in Europe. One in right. five children and one in ten adults in London suffer from asthma because of the air quality. 
And is the air quality different at different times of year? We, we look at the summer and we think of humidity. We also, which we can get into in a while, talk about allergies and hay fever and things like that. But it, are the times of year when it, the pollution in London and places is worse? Summertime is the worst. More air, quality, more air pollution during the summer, especially with the sensitive airways and people who have allergy suffer. And what about some of the Asian countries where we see people wearing masks and things like that? Are, are they actually affected? To be honest, no. To filter the air, you need to have 14, one four, 14 oh. layers of tissue. But it perhaps makes them feel comfortable, makes them feel happy. Uh, dust is the most problem, the, the biggest problem in the in the pollution in the industrial countries, and certainly in the Middle East and in the Far East. And of course, the governments around the world, and certainly here in Britain, where they're trying to do a lot about the air quality in our cities. And first of all, addressing this issue where it's really affecting asthma sufferers in a, in a bad way. What, because we, we hear these pollution alerts and things like that, what are the sort of things and what the measures that asthma sufferers can take when they're aware that pollution is a little bit higher? Take their medications regularly. The unfortunate thing about asthma is that people resent the label asthma. So we have reluctance on parts of patients to accept the diagnosis because asthma's treatment is expensive. There is reluctance on part of the health professionals to diagnose the disease and sadly they give only half the treatment they give treatment that opens up the airways but does not clear the inflammation which is the major cause of the symptoms and people do not like to take regular inhaled medications especially when they are young it's not, between inverted commas, cool to use an inhaler. You want to go yeah, clubbing. No, nobody's and, managed to design a really design or version of it yet to make it look we better. we are lucky. We have inhalers to be used once a day. The problem is we have to convince people that asthma cannot be cured. It can be controlled. And you have to take the preventer when you are well to stay well. And this is something that people resent. If I am well, why should I take medicine when, they are, when I am well? And it is, that's a tough thing, isn't it? When people are showing no symptoms yes. and they feel absolutely fine to yes. then say you need to take this as a preventative measure. I mean, that's, that's a bit of a tough sell Indeed. sometimes. Indeed, it is tough. And then they are in, in denial. And then they reduce their exercise. People should not reduce their exercise. They try and not do the things that make them feel breathless. We encourage people with asthma to take their medications regularly and exercise, push themselves. And there's two types of asthma, of course, aren't there? There's the childhood asthma, yes. which um, many children actually grow out of. But then Indeed. there's this adult asthma. To talk about the difference and, yes. and how that actually yes. happens. Childhood asthma is easy to tolerate and easy to control and there are good medicines for that but again they have to take it regularly until they grow out of it there is no rule when they grow out of it people vary but unless they take the medications regularly they, they it, there will be a delay in growing out of the asthma and it's usually allergy childhood asthma is usually allergy young asthma usually allergy up to the age of 30 after that, adult asthma or late onset asthma is a mystery. We don't know. There is no age limit. I see people for the first time in their lives who, who develop asthma in their 80s, in their 70s, 80s. And it's, it's very difficult to explain to them. But asthma is a disease that you have to diagnose by listening to the patient. It's the history. I am breathless and I am wheezy. And if they do not smoke, it has to be asthma. Tests can be negative because it's an episodic problem. There are times when they are perfect and times when they are not well. But again, we are lucky. We have now tablets for a special type of asthma, which is exercise-induced asthma. And they take it once a day. 
Now, in the introduction, we talked about the possibility of genetics playing a part. So it, could there be something in your disposition for asthma, or is that just more of a general lung condition? It could be something in your uh, disposition, but it's not genetic because we cannot identify a gene. We call it familial. So you can see a cluster of asthma in the same family. We don't understand. What we know in the 21st century in medicine is less than what we don't know. So it's a difficult condition. We don't have a cure. We only can control it. We don't know what causes it. People resent it. Doctors are reluctant to make the diagnosis. In case of children, parents are reluctant to accept the diagnosis for their children. And this maintenance treatment, people resent the idea of taking the medication when they are well to stay well. But it can be a problem. Asthma kills. And in again, the UK. We, need to, we will keep on with that message throughout yes. the show about making sure you maintain the preventative measures. I want to come back to this uh, question about exercise, yes. that there's this perception sometimes that if you have lung problems, if you have breathing difficulties, therefore you shouldn't overexert yourself and take exercise. That's a fallacy. That's the opposite. We should exercise when we have asthma or we have a lung condition, push ourselves. If we feel breathless, there are relief medications to take and to continue the exercise. So is, is the lung almost like a bit of a muscle in that, in that yes. sense that you can, you can build it its strength? It expands, absolutely, absolutely. Athletes, actually, there are many athletes have asthma. Famous people, Ian Botham, the cricketer, had asthma. And uh, David Beckham has asthma. So it shouldn't Paula be any Ratcliffe. impediment to your sporting It should prowess. never. No. And actually, children who have asthma score better in sports, and they have above-average intelligence. So they do better in school. Maybe because they resist this label that they have a problem, they want to prove themselves. But if they take the medications regularly, they do grow out of it. And it's great for young people to have role models like David Beckham. Oh, absolutely. Because he hopefully can normalise the fact that preventative measures are a good thing. And actually, you know what? It doesn't matter who you are, how famous you are, you can still be affected. Absolutely. I want to come to the broader subject of, of lung health. The big thing we always associate with lung disease and lung health, and you can read my mind, I'm sure, it's smoking. Smoking, absolutely. Now, absolutely. what is it about smoking that makes it so bad, it's particularly for lungs? We know it affects all sorts of our um, parts of our bodies, but lungs particularly. Yes, smoking affects the lungs in a bad way. It's the tar content of the smoke. Because when people smoke not the pure nicotine, they smoke the additives, the tar, and that's carcinogenic, meaning it causes cancer. The knowledge became available in 1963, and sadly it was suppressed because of the tobacco lobby was very powerful. People suppressed the, 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 the information. One in eight smokers gets lung cancer. There is no escape. And that's quite a shocking statistic. It's a shocking statistic. And the, the other thing as well, which is an interesting one, is, the, is this whole thing of vaping. And uh, although we've, yes. we've, we've touched on smoking before, so I don't want to spend too much time on it, but this thing of, of vaping, in terms of lung health, what's the comparison between vaping and smoking? Much, much safer. Definitely okay. no link to cancer. Perfect. It may irritate the lungs because asthmatics should not vape, okay. should not inhale any vapor at all but safer. Let's look at the broader issue of lung disease. What other kind of lung diseases are there and what are they caused by? Chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, it's smoking related and it is common. Emphysema, 99% of smokers get emphysema because emphysema destroys the lungs. The lung tissue is destroyed by the smoke and it enlarges so people can take more oxygen. They have problems getting the oxygen from the lung, from the air they, they, they breathe. And they end up having big chests, useless lungs. And it's an awful feeling to, to feel what people with emphysema have is to take a deep breath until you can't take any more. Hold it and try and breathe in and out on top of that almost impossible 
And that's what people with emphysema feel all the time. The one really positive thing about smoking, and this sounds like an ironic question, but is the fact that the lung seems to be one of those rare parts of the body that can heal itself. That you hear about people who have smoked and have given up, that after a certain period of time, and not that long, are almost considered non-smokers because the body has this ability to somehow deal with it. That's true. Five years. Five to seven years. But there are people who are unlucky. There are people who are unlucky because they stop smoking and five years on, they develop cancer. The seeds of cancer have been planted already. So it's a big risk. So one should not smoke. Passive smoking. One does a lot of harm to loved ones when you smoke around. People say, I go to the garden. They still come back with the smell of smoke. And children who have sensitive airways are affected. It can cause cancer. Somebody sued a company, a tobacco company in the States, because she got lung cancer because her husband smoked heavily. She was a passive smoker. And again, we, we've done um, programs on smoking, but very quickly, from your perspective as a lung expert, what's your recommended way of giving up smoking? Vaping today is the most important one and the most reliable one. But there is one which is equally better, if not better, hypnotherapy. But it's not any hypnotherapist. You've got to have someone reliable. There are good people who would refund you f their fee if you don't quit smoking. They sort of make you believe that this cigarette is so awful that you cannot touch it. And it, it does work. And to get good advice on hypnotherapy and other kind, other methods of giving up, your GP is probably the best port Oh, absolutely. Call. Absolutely, yes. When people have any form of lung disease or respiratory problems, what are the initial telltale signs that should alert people to think, actually, I should get this checked out? Cough and shortness of breath, especially cough. Of course, if we get a cold, we feel uh, irritation in the throat and we cough, it should clear in a few days. If it lingers for a week or two weeks, definitely one should see the GP, get an X-ray. It could be an infection. It could be a threatening, a life-threatening infection. So, and of course, cough can be a presenting symptom of severe or, or, or serious diseases like lung cancer. And if we look at the lung health generally, you talked about exercise is great because it's building up that lung muscle. What other things can we do that's going to really help us have healthy lungs for long life? Avoid pollution. Smoky atmospheres. Don't sit with people who smoke. Uh, they have done a lot to reduce industrial emissions but still a lot needs to be done. So avoiding situations when you are inhaling substances and there are occupational diseases resulting from occupations where you deal with pollution like uh, cotton mills and uh, uh, weavers and uh, people who work with plants any form of pollution can harm the sensitive airways. Because it's going through the airwaves because exactly, of your environment. Exactly. Looking at lung health generally, and people looking after it, they, they avoid um, pollution, they take some exercise, and if they can't, for example, you know, avoid, they live in London, for example, they can't do anything about that. Are there any other kind of measures that they can do? You know, for example, is, is walking to work better than, you know, going on a bus or a car or the tube? Or Are there any kind of ideas you have in that respect? Ideally, they should sort of take walks during the weekend where the air quality is better. Visit the parks, green, green areas. Avoid the inner city polluted roads, if possible. Driving and walking, well, it depends how far your job is. If it is better, if it's easier to walk, I would rather walk.
No, absolutely. It's, and it's got, always got to be good for all aspects of, of our health. Yes. What about some of the treatments? We've just got a couple of minutes left before we go to break. But I just want to talk a little bit about the treatments because you imagine that they can be quite invasive. For asthma, it's actually simple. There are inhalers that co produce relief. They relax the muscle that wraps the tubes. All the tubes, even the tiny ones, are wrapped in muscle. So if they close and inhaled medicine, a reliever inhaled medicine would open them up. But that's not enough. The big problem is the inflammation in the lining of the airways. So you need the preventer. We are lucky we have preventers that you take once a day. Sadly, people take it a few days regularly, feel better, they think they are cured. They leave it, take it when they feel they need it. And that's, the, that's dangerous. And what about if you see someone who is having respiratory problems, maybe an asthma attack, until the ambulance comes, is there anything that they should be doing? If they are known asthmatics, they should reach for the relief inhaler and they take as many doses as possible because it's very safe. We in hospital, you give people the equivalent of 200 puffs in one day. That's a whole inhaler. So can safely, safely put, uh, it's, it's something very simple like a, a, a paper cup, make a hole in the bottom of the paper cup, put the inhaler through, put the paper cup on top of the mouth and squeeze, inhale, squeeze, inhale. 20 puffs, 30 puffs, 50 puffs can be life saving. Great advice. And again, as we've said all the way through the show, make sure you take your preventative haler as well. Indeed. We've got lots more to talk about, but at the moment it's uh, unfortunately time for a short break, uh, but we will be back. In the meantime, we must stress that should you suffer from any medical problems or health concerns, it's always highly recommended that you contact your doctor or GP as the health show gives you an alternative viewpoint to the health concern being discussed. We'll be right back. Welcome back to The Health Show, where our topic today is lung disease. And in the studio, we have with us Dr. Saeed Abdallah, a consultant chest physician. Dr. Saeed has been giving us some really good insights on the different kinds of diseases that we may need to look out for. But before we continue our conversation, let's take a look at how the respiratory system can cope in circumstances such as in this next clip, where medics in Hawaii say respiratory diseases and mental health are key concerns following the eruption of the Kilauea volcano. Let's take a look. People who are frail or who have underlying COPD, that's chronic lung disease, we worry about them quite a lot. That can be made much worse by spikes in sulfur dioxide. So checking people's lungs, making sure they have their medications, making sure we evacuate them further away if, if they're bad. So that's one. A lot of people have essentially suffered uh, PTSD, you know, um, they're, they're traumatized. So when you have uh, PTSD, you don't respond as well or norm to normal circumstances. You're in close proximity. So having this stress disorder means that we're mindful of people who have depression, bipolar disease, schizophrenia, or just uh, the associated symptoms of PTSD. So we need medical supplies. It would be, it's been great. I think actually the Red Cross has done a very good job. Uh, but having bandages, having some antibiotics from uh, the pharmacies and pharmaceutical companies would be great. People should send them to the Red Cross in Hawaii. Uh, some re respiratory medications like the albuterol inhalers would be great to have here. More masks that are um, rated for actual sulfur dioxide, not just flimsy little masks, the proper masks. I mean, that was fascinating seeing that particular report. And of course, fortunately, we're not most of us in volcanic areas and getting yeah. that dust and ash, which, you know, you talked about pollution before. But what was interesting is the mental health connection. Tell us a little bit more about how the two link. I can't link the mental health unless it is the shock of living through such panic. It's perhaps something like uh, this stress disorder. And of course, anybody who has any form of lung condition, you know, that stress 
of can you know, thinking you're about attack. to have an asthmatic attack yes. or something like that must be yes. very distressing. Yes. And yes. you talk for that matter about people who are, don't want to have the preventative measures of, of asthma because, again, there's a stigma. And I can yes. imagine that having a stigma towards something can cause anxiety. Yes, indeed. Indeed. Let's talk now a little bit more about other aspects of lung disease. We've talked about um, smoking, emphysema, and we talked about asthma. What other kinds of infections or diseases are there? Yes, there are people who have low immunity. Typical scenario, they get a cold. Usually it's over, but then it lingers. Then they start coughing, and the cough persists, and they do not respond to antibiotics and further courses of antibiotics and they still keep, keep coughing and then they settle after a while instead of clearing the infection in a week it takes two or three then they get recurrent episodes then the penny should drop we should think immunity these people may have low levels of antibodies that help them fight infection so we measure their antibody levels and that's curable because we can replace the missing link, the missing uh, prevention, give them the antibodies that their system cannot manufacture. These are gamma globulins manufactured in the liver. Some people are born with a deficiency. So we give them regular injections of antibodies to help them. Milder can forms, you can give them the anti-pneumonia vaccine. And does this happen at any particular age? Is it more prevalent in older people, or can it happen at any age? It can happen at any age. We don't understand. And it can be familial. And we, we hear about um, people having bronchitis and bronchial diseases, and that's, again, all to do with the lung, is it? Indeed. Sadly, there is this culture of antibiotics are bad. Don't give antibiotics. But people can overdo this and deny people who need antibiotics, the treatment. The result is chronic lung disease. Typical scenario, a pneumonia, a patch of pneumonia that was not adequately treated leads to scarring of the lungs, a condition we call bronchiectasis. Ectasis means big. The airways are distended, are widened, are scarred. And sadly, it's a lifelong condition. They need to go and have physiotherapy to clear their airways, and they cough and make phlegm. It could have been prevented had they been given proper, adequate antibiotics initially when they had the acute phase infection. And again, this comes up time and time again on these shows where people talk about making sure you acknowledge the early signs of something going wrong. Definitely, on. definitely. Never leave a cough for more than two weeks maximum provided you had antibiotics of course it should clear if it doesn't it warrants medical advice x-ray three x-ray examination and seeing a chest physician now this is something that's really really surprised me is that what we know as snoring is actually affected by the lungs, where I always thought it was something to do with the ear, nose, and throat, but it's actually coming from the lungs. Well, Tell the us breathing, a bit more about yes, that. the breathing system starts with the nose. Nose, then the voice box, and then the upper airways. And obstructive sleep apnea is a condition very common. One in 40, one in 40 males, especially overweight, suffers from the condition. What happens is when we go to sleep, we relax, the muscles around the, this, the voice box relax and they can block the airways. And if we are overweight, fatty tissue can, can develop around the voice box and the uh, uh, windpipe, causes obstruction of the airways. Now, because obstruction causes lack of oxygen, so we snore as an effort to get more oxygen in, and typically, the, the snoring becomes louder and louder, and then they stop breathing because the low oxygen level do not, does not stimulate them to breathe. We have to get a higher carbon dioxide level to make them breathe. So they stop breathing, carbon dioxide level goes up, they start breathing with a gasp. It's treatable. Simply lose weight. It's not easy to do that, but there are little machines that people can attach themselves to 
like a little mask with a tube attached to a machine that forces the airways to open. It's blocked the airways, it forces them to open. Why is snoring so much more prevalent with men than with women? Or is that, or is that just another myth? It's not a myth, it's actually, because I suspect, because men usually smoke, more men usually smoke, but it can affect women. There are things that we don't understand, like thyroid disease, eight times commoner in women than in men. We don't understand. I guess, and it's a guess, that because we, men smoke and um, irritate their airways, and perhaps obesity. Is obesity more common in men or women? Well, obese people, I think it's the same equal <laughs> ratio. <laughs> Get. Well, well, that's that's certainly an interesting debate, which I'm certainly not brave <laughs> enough to get into. What about um, cultural differences? Are there people from certain certain ethnic communities who might be more disposed, dis, disposed uh, more disposed towards um, lung problems? Yes, and so on? absolutely. We should never forget pulmonary tuberculosis. It's an ethnic disease. We ethnic minority people are more susceptible to get pulmonary tuberculosis. It's 100% curable, but it has a bit of a stigma around it. And it's common in ethnic minority. Why? Because it reflects their rate of, 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 of the incidence in their country of origin, even a next generation or third generation. Let me give you an example. I was going to say, first, and then explain the disease, if you the, could. Yeah, pulmonary tuberculosis is a specific infection. In short, TB is caused by a bacteria called Mycobacterium tuberculosis. It used to be a common infection in the early 20th century. It killed almost 40,000 people a year in London and not in ethnic minority groups because there were no ethnic minority groups then. It's common in poor areas in the world like Sub-Saharan Africa, Southeast Asia, and it's common in the East, more common, even in Europe. So you have more TB in France than in England, more in Italy than in France, more in Greece than in Italy, more in Poland than in Greece, and so on and so forth. If a child is born abroad in an area where TB is, is prevalent, and you bring the child to the United Kingdom, it doesn't change the sensitivity. So if someone is coughing up mycobacterium tuberculosis bugs, that child will catch it first. So can it lay dormant within the system? It can, and they call it latent disease. That's why one of the activities I used to do in chest clinic when I was appointed years ago is to screen everybody who comes. Every newcomer should be examined, make sure he had or she had BCG. A chest X-ray is done to make sure they don't have. These people are very susceptible. Sadly, the, the focus of infection is in Europe. And that's a fallacy. People think that ethnic minority people bring TB with them. Sadly not. They develop it here within two years of coming to the UK on average. And sadly, in the 90s, chest clinics were closed up and down the country. And that led to, to, to increase, a, a big increase in the instance of tuberculosis. London being a, a cosmopolitan city with lots of ethnic minority people is actually labeled the tuberculosis capital of Europe. So again, ethnic minority patient or individual coughing for two or three weeks should think tuberculosis, chest x-ray, very simple. And diagnosis. after all, we do live in a, in a more of a migrant society with people traveling around, coming from lots of different parts of the world. Absolutely. And what's interesting is, is how, again, how treatable it is. It is 100% curable, but you have to make the diagnosis. So it's so easy to make the diagnosis. I could see a patient within the session, within an hour, I can make the diagnosis. Take a sample of the sputum, examine it for the bug, bug is there, start treatment, but by, by which time he or she had infected 12 different people on average. So you have to make an early diagnosis to prevent it. And the other challenge is that, again, we see time and time again on this show where sometimes um, there are members of these communities who are reluctant to go to doctors. They're reluctant to, to seek medical Sadly help. Sadly true. Sadly true. Yes, they always... 
sadly there are homeless people uh, unfortunate people who are uh, drug addicts or alcoholics are very susceptible white people have if you like grown out of tuberculosis and ethnic minority people are lagging behind so nowadays you you you, you don't see tuberculosis in an indigenous born white person unless this person is alcoholic or drug addict or homeless and as you said, you know, yet again, you know, there's a little bit of a stigma associated with it, maybe because it isn't um, a disease that's actually, you know, prevalent here anymore in the UK, apart from people who come from maybe other countries. If you, somebody who's watching, you know, is, is a member of a community that maybe they are reluctant to go and seek help, what sort of things should they, A, be looking out for in other people that could be... Of respiratory issues that they need to get solved and what do you suggest they do unexplained cough loss of weight night sweating uh, an x-ray very simple or, or if they are producing phlegm a sputum examination and it's easily diagnosed and easily treated problem again compliance you need to take a course of treatment for six months People feel better after a month or two, stop the treatment, which is awful. So we have directly observed treatment. So we can send a nurse to the people to give them the tablets and make sure they swallow it. And again, as we've said many times during the show, if you're prescribed something, take the full course right to the end. And if it's preventative, take absolutely. that too. Absolutely. The other thing as well within different communities, you know, people look at diet and they look at the lifestyle. Does that affect lung health at all? Apart from smoking, of course. Alcohol, although I don't really know exactly the link, affects health, there is no doubt. In the Times of London yesterday, they said bacon and alcohol increase the risk of cancer. And it's so interesting because in the Quran, it was mentioned 1400 years ago that we should avoid the meat of the pig and alcohol. It's funny, isn't it, how sometimes there's something there, a subliminal reason yes. uh, for, 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 for some of these things. Yes. Looking at the treatment for lung diseases and so on, we've talked about asthma and the uh, taking your inhalers and things. How many of these diseases are going to require some form of surgery, or is that really only in extreme circumstances? Only in extreme. Lung cancer, if people are lucky, it can be curable with surgery. If they diagnose it early and remove it, it's a cure. Chronic lung disease that is severe can be cured by removing that part of the lung. We have two lungs, thank God for that. Each lung has three lobes and each lobe has five segments. So if we can locate the disease in a lobe or in a segment and remove it surgically, that can be a cure. One of the challenges for coming back to smoking is this, the smoker's cough. And uh, I know somebody who's got this terrible cough and it sort of like seems a permanent cough and it's something you don't see quite so much anymore because the amount of smoking has gone down. How does that person know whether that's a smoker's cough, which is just one of those things that they've had for many years, versus something that's a bit more sinister. Shouldn't have cough. There is nothing called smoker's cough to accept <laughs> okay. as a fact. Should seek help to prevent this cough. If it is chronic obstructive lung disease, there is treatment. Different inhalers than the asthma treatment, although similar, would reduce the cough. If it is a chronic lung condition causes the cough, causing the cough, physiotherapy to stop people coughing. One should not put up with a chronic symptom, definitely not. Lung disease, cough, breathlessness can be prevented. It's like pain. We can give people painkillers. People should not wait until they have pain to take painkillers, to take it as prevention. Similarly, if people have a chronic cough, they should seek advice. There are inhalers to suppress the cough, inhalers to reduce the mucus that causes cough, and regular treatment again would rid them of the symptoms. Nobody should accept. People similarly say, oh, it's this my, my, my usual breathlessness. There is no usual breathlessness. 
And it's interesting, isn't it, how people just get in the habit of accepting certain yes. things. Yes. And, and again, looking at um, the sort of general health and, and general lung health for people, um, is anything that we eat, can that make a difference? Unless we are allergic to something, which we will know by experience, should avoid things that we are allergic to. And that's an interesting question because allergies are very often associated with lung issues. You know, where that time of year where hay fever is still around and things. Why, why do these allergies seem to be increasing? Why are we getting more young people especially with these allergies? We don't know, but I've, it is more recognized. People are making the effort to diagnose these allergies. And again, one can treat these allergies. Anti-allergic tablets if they have wheeze but not asthma related to the allergy then a relief inhaler would be enough severe forms you can desensitize them give them sh small doses of an, an a substance to help them get used to the allergen that they are allergic to and it can be successful and it's, you know, again, one of the messages that's coming through from you over and over again is actually if you diagnose something early, it's incredibly treatable. Is there any aspect of lung health we haven't talked about that yet? Maybe some more rare forms of disease that people might contract? I think it's genetic problems like cystic fibrosis, but that is diagnosed at birth. People should be able to make the diagnosis, and it's genetic. And fortunately, there is a huge advance now in treating cystic fibrosis. It's a congenital disease that causes secretions that block the airways. Usually, in, in the previous decades, they die young, but now people with cystic fibrosis live until their 50s or even 60s, and they get married and have children. Again, it's a system of regular physiotherapy, regular antibiotics for infection. Some people who have regular infections because they have chronic lung illness require regular courses of antibiotics, and it's no problem. We should recognize this. And again, I, I love the, the theme coming out. This really isn't a problem. It's easily treatable. And going back to allergies just for a second, we hear a lot about pet allergies, you know, people being allergic to dogs, to cats, and there's a, a report I saw a while ago which claimed that if a child was born into a family where there are pets, they almost seem to build up a resistance that maybe children who are exposed to it when they anything from a year or two old onwards, they don't have that. I, I, again, is there any fact in that? Yes, yes, that is true. That is true. In a, it's a form of desensitization because the immune system in the newborn is primitive and you could desensitize them if you expose them gradually to the pets. So they become used to it in lay terms. So they don't develop allergies to it. So again, people may be born in the countryside around farms and things. They, they have just, they're just more used to the amount of yes. um, pollen in the air and animals and so on. Yes, indeed. But some people are allergic, irrespective, even if they are born in the countryside with animals. And those have to avoid exposure to the allergies. Now, coming back to that same principle, we talked about pollution at the very beginning of the show. What about that? Can you almost desensitize yourself against it because you're around it, or is it just one of those toxic elements that a bit no difficult, help you? Uh, a bit difficult. You have to purify the air. You can't desensitize yourself against diesel fumes and industrial pollution. And That's it's the particulates, difficult. isn't it, that causes the Definitely. bigger problem? Yes that makes the airways extremely sensitive. Just to finish off, I always like to give people something to think about. So have you got some key messages to people when it comes to respiratory health? Maybe just a, one or two key things that you'd like to tell our audience about to make sure that they're on top of. Yes, asthmatics, please take the preventer when you are well to stay well. And people in general don't ignore symptoms of lung disease such as cough that doesn't settle quickly with antibiotics or shortness of breath or pain in the chest that can be sinister and that's a message we've said all the way through the show never ignore the smallest change in your system because it could Absolutely. it could lead to something else and you can avoid yes. more heartache and pain later on if you do and so. most importantly please don't smoke
Very good. Thank you very much indeed. Most welcome. Absolutely fantastic. Thank you. Unfortunately, that's all we have time for. I'd like to thank our guest again, Dr. Saeed Abdallah, for um, all of his great information. As you know, he's a consultant chest physician, and he's shared some vital information and knowledge with us of how to better our health in terms of our respiratory system. And I hope you watching at home have found the show beneficial. Once again, we must stress that should you suffer from any medical problems or health concerns whatsoever, it's always highly recommended that you contact your doctor or GP as the health show gives you an alternative viewpoint to the health show, the health concern being discussed. Now, if you'd like to find out more about this or any of the subjects we've discussed on the show, please do email us at healthshow at islamchannel.tv. But for now, it's goodbye for me. Thank you very much indeed for watching and see you next week. Asalaamu Alaikum.